My name is Bob, Bob Bailey, and I'm a member here at Albany Church. Our reading this morning uh, comes from Genesis, Genesis 25, and it's verses 19 to 26. Genesis 25, verses 19 to 26. This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padat Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins, boys, in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Let us uh, pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the history that we have recorded here over so many generations and thousands of years. And we thank you, Lord, we can rely upon that. And as we've been reading this morning, it's about real people, men and women, boys and girls, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers. We thank you, Lord, that you came into this world as a baby. The Word became flesh and lived among us. And we give you thanks, Lord, that it's about real people. And Lord, this morning we pray that you will bless Ian as he speaks, that you will guide his thoughts, Lord, and each one of us may be encouraged as we hear your word. These things we ask in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Wasn't that incredible worship? I thought it was so powerful when we were all together just saying, declaring, uh, not just singing, but actually declaring the cross has the final word. And whatever's going on in your life at the moment, whatever you're facing, the reality is the cross has more power. Jesus is bigger and he's stronger and the cross has the final word. And thank you to Bob for coming and doing our reading from Albany Church. One of the things that I've also loved in terms of the chat stream is just hearing people tuning in from all over the place, uh, not just all over the place in the UK, but it's great to have you uh, tuning in from Devon regularly, the Rosses. It's great to have you, Jail, in, in Plymouth, joining us today. It's great to have the new family in Colchester joining together as well, as well as it's amazing to have people in the Netherlands in uh, Cape Town and even in Spain. Duncan and Sue went on holiday this uh, last week to Spain. They were thinking they were going for two weeks. Now they're in quarantine. So we're expecting to see you again maybe next summer, something like that. Duncan and Sue have a great holiday and away a bit longer than anticipated. But it is really crazy times that we're living in, isn't it? Um, but in these crazy times, we want to get hold of and we want to celebrate the good that Jesus is still doing. A piece of good news that happened yesterday, we had our second response store lockdown wedding. So Stephen and Lily uh, Leonard got married yesterday. They got married in a field in Amersham uh, with uh, immediate family only, but our very own Trina Simpson was uh, speaking at the wedding. So that's Stephen and Lily on your screens right now. Stephen and Lily actually are going to be living as newlyweds just around the corner from here. They're moving into the flat that we have in Woodford. They're both going to be working uh, part-time and they're going to be giving lots of their time and energy into local mission and also working with our 
our young people. So that's a really, really exciting development. So today I'm going to carry on with our uh, summer series, which is uh, Running with the Giants. Uh, we've done a series that we've called Running with the Giants for the last few years, and we're looking at heroes of the faith. So we're looking at some of the people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11 that are there to inspire us in terms of what it is possible that God can do with ordinary people who end up doing heroic acts, uh, some of them big, some of them really small and every day, but every one of them significant for God. And we're taking the inspiration of that to say each of us are able to live a life of significance and of purpose in God. And we felt for this year in particular, we felt that God want, wanted to speak something to us about the uh, ability that he has to bring something wonderful out of times of challenge. And so what we're doing through this series is we're looking at six characters and all of them had supernatural births. So they were all born into uh, uh, families who had given up on being able to have kids. But supernaturally, God uh, intervened and children were produced. And so their very lives represent the ability of God to bring something supernaturally fruitful. And I don't know about you, but this last season has maybe had more challenge in it than any other season before. And just when you thought it was going to come to an end, then we get an upsurge again in infections. And it feels like we're having to be uh, cautious and retreat a little bit more. And it makes you think, how long is this going to go on? And the reality is, we don't know how long this season will go on for. It seems like it's going to go on for quite some time. What I do know, though, is that God is with us and God is able to bring incredible fruit out of this season if we put ourselves into him because the cross has the final word. And last week, Lauren was uh, looking at uh, Isaac. Isaac's name uh, means laughter. And so she was looking at how uh, one of the helpful things to do in times of challenge is to think of all the things that we can be grateful for and thank God for. It was lovely in our worship because it felt like together we were having an opportunity to do that. And I saw some people uh, putting onto the chat stream some things that they can be thankful uh, uh, to God for, even though uh, life might be hard. And that's a good discipline to put into our everyday lives. Today we're going to move on to our next character, our next supernatural birth, and today we're looking at the character of Jacob. Now I love the character of Jacob, uh, and what we're drawing out of Jacob's life is how to let the journey shape your character. How to let the journey of life, and in particular the journey of challenge, shape your character. And I really love Jacob. One of the reasons I love Jacob is because actually when you first encounter him, he's quite an unlikable um, character. And there's lots of, of things about him that you don't warm to. And yet through the journey of his life, he ends up being uh, significant for God. And God changes him from what is quite an unlikable character into somebody who actually becomes the founding father of Israel. So if Abraham was the founding father of faith, it's actually Jacob who later on in his life, God changes his name and says, now you're going to become Israel. And from him becomes the people that God uses most significantly in all of the Old Testament. So it's quite a character transformation. And in these days, um, what we need is we need leaders and people of integrity and people of character. And the reality is character is often forged in a furnace and it's often forged in the furnace of trials. And so in this season, if we lean into Jesus, maybe Jesus is going to form something wonderfully new and wonderfully deep in our character that is going to enable us to then be significant for God into the future. So I said that Jacob had a little bit of a complex history. Um, actually, Jacob's problem was his history. And there's a debate that goes on. Um, are we the product of uh, nature or of nurture? And the reality is Jacob was the, pro was, was the product of both, and neither of them were particularly good. So in terms of what he was born into, the name Jacob it actually means one who holds the heel of another or one who tries to supplant another. And so he was born into conflict 
object. He was one of twins. He's, he's uh, the younger brother of Esau. And right from within their mother's womb, they were at war with one another. And when he comes out, he's got, the hold, of, he's got hold of his brother's heel. And instantly, he's trying to compete to get ahead of his brother. And not only that, but the nurture of his early years, it says that his father, Isaac, loved his brother, um, Esau, more than him, whereas his mother loved uh, uh, Jacob more than Esau. So there was this family rivalry that then worked out. And the reality of that was Jacob didn't know who he really was. And if we don't ever discover who God made us to be, we end up trying to become someone else. I'll say that for you again. If, if we never find out who God created us to be, we will always end up trying to be someone else. And Jacob has this gap in it, this sense of identity, this sense of who God's made him to be. So he spends his whole life trying to be Esau. And actually, it comes to an interesting conclusion in Genesis chapter 27, because in order to get the blessing that should have been Esau's, um, what Jacob actually does is he puts on the whole of Esau's clothes. So he puts on his garments. He even gets animal skins to make him hairy like his, his brother Esau to fool his father, who by that stage was blind, into giving him the blessing. So literally, he puts on somebody else's identity to try and get something that God never intended for him in the first place. And I find that really interesting because I think if we're honest... For many of us, in the gaps within our hearts and the gaps within our identity and the gaps within the sense of who am I actually? What is my destiny? What is my calling? Out of those gaps, if we're not careful, we end up putting a costume or some clothes on to try and hide the inner gap that we feel. It's really interesting the way you see it um, work out in the book of Genesis because as soon as Adam and Eve separate themselves from God... So they do their own thing instead of God's thing. The very next thing they do is they start to put on clothes and they start to hide from one another. Why? Because they're carrying now a sense of shame. And the second time we see someone in the book of Genesis put on clothes, it's uh, Noah. And his sons uh, put some clothes on him when Noah gets drunk. Maybe you didn't know that about Noah at the end of the story. Uh, maybe out of survivor's guilt, who knows what led him to that place. But he ends up getting drunk and ends up with no clothes on. So his sons actually come and clothe him. But the first two references to people wearing clothes in the book of Genesis is to hide shame. And what many of us do when we feel inadequate on the inside is we put on an exterior to try and hide something. Now, the next five references to people wearing clothes or significant incidences involving people wearing clothes in the book of Genesis, every single one of them involves a story of deception. And so those clothes that people have put on to hide their shame becomes actually that something that they hide behind and end up deceiving other people. And I find that really interesting because I wonder how often we try and present to the world something that actually isn't true because we're trying to hide our own lack of, of identity and who God had made us to be. So a question for you this morning. You may want to answer this on the chat stream if you're really bold and brave, um, but don't feel you need to at all. But how do I try to mask my insecurity? How do I try to mask my insecurity? Because the truth is, we all do try to in one way or another. So for Jacob, his insecurity meant he tried to become, literally tried to become Esau. I was the youngest of three boys, so I can relate to some of it. Actually, um, I was born in the 60s, and so there was lots of uh, uh, Wild West uh, programs on the, on the TV, things like uh, The High Chaparral and Bonanza and all of those sort of things that the next generation have got no idea what I'm talking about this morning. But anyway, before the age of YouTube, when there was only BBC and ITV, that's the kind of thing that we used to watch. But um, as the youngest of three boys, my oldest brother's six years older than me, 
second brother's four years older than me, um, the convenient thing whenever you wanted to play the Wild West was uh, in all the Wild West uh, series, there was always a jail. There was always a, a, a sheriff and a deputy and, uh, and a jail. And the sheriff was normally the good guy who sorted out all the problems in the town. But they always needed somebody to have in jail. And I was the little one in the playpen, which was a perfect made jail. And so in all the family games, I would end up in jail while everyone else had all the fun. Now, I didn't count that as much fun. And so I quickly wanted to grow up and prove that I was as good as my brothers. And so I threw myself into achieving. And I threw myself in, into trying to achieve at school. And I threw myself into the fact that if I succeed and succeed academically beyond what my brothers do, have done, then I'll prove that I'm worth something. And as I look back on my life now, I see that it, for the first 20, 30 years of my life, a lot of my uh, identity was driven by a desire to achieve. But it was driven there because there was a gap on the inside about what my real identity was. Now, yours may not be achievement. For, for some people, we do literally try to mask it with what we wear or what we look like. Interesting uh, thing about being on uh, a screen in what feels like a TV studio is uh, I love chocolate. You know one distinctive about the King household is we love a bit of chocolate. Uh, fortunately, I don't get many zits. But on about the third week of our live stream, I had a great zit come up on my chin. And so I'm getting ready to come to church on a, on a Sunday morning. And Chris says to me, you can't go out with that zit. And you can't appear on TV with that zit. And so she went and got some of her, her uh, masking stuff. There's a proper word for it. Concealer, that's it. I just needed a woman to help me with that. Maybe you're glad to know that. Maybe Alex would have known it if I'd asked him. Who knows? Anyway, we'll carry on. Don't put the answer to that on the live stream. Sorry, Juliet, didn't mean it. There's lots of laughter in the studio now. <laughs> really interesting. Anyway, so Chris got a bit of a concealer and put it on my chin just so that I'd look perfect on a Sunday morning. But how many of us, if we're honest, that's what we do? We know that we have blemishes and we try to mask them. Do you know God doesn't want us to be a people that mask our blemishes? Actually, God wants us to know we're in a safe place and if we come to him, he's willing to come and wash away our blemishes and give us a new start and heal us on those gaps within our sense of identity and worth and significance. And so for Jacob, he spent his whole life hiding. He spent his whole life trying to be uh, like his brother. He spent his whole life letting his insecurity dominate him. And in love, God has to do something about that. And so what God does is he takes Jacob on a journey where God applies pressure to him to squeeze out the impurities, to bring him to a place where God can change his sense of identity and purpose and significance. And hard times God uses to squeeze us to bring up to the surface what needs to be dealt with. Hard times don't often plant something new in our heart. What they do, though, is squeeze up to the surface what was really there, hidden away in our hearts. Over this last season, I think I've experienced both personally, but also in terms of pastoring and leading a community of people, more squeezing than ever before. And I've seen more pain come up to the surface than maybe ever before, more insecurity come up to the surface than ever before, and in some ways more conflict than ever before. Why? Because the squeezing is showing us what's really there. And for Jacob, you see, he deceived his brother. After he deceived his brother out of his birthright, he uh, fears for his life. And because of that, he runs away to his uncle who lived a long, long way away. So he runs away in fear to his uncle. When he gets to his uncle's household, he discovers uh, Rachel, who he falls in love with. And he thinks, I want her to be my wife. And so he says to his uncle, Rachel is his uh, cousin, he says to his uncle, um, can I marry Rachel? And his uncle says, yes, you just got to work for me for seven years to get that. And so Jacob does that. It's actually lovely the way it says it in, in the Bible, because it says the seven years seem but a day. Oh, to be in love. Oh, what it feels like when you're in love, hey? 
and got married 25 years ago. Uh, this year, 9th of September, we'll be married for 25 years. Congratulations to Chris on uh, surviving 25 years being married to me. Um, I can't always say it's just felt like a day, um, but when you're in love, that is what it feels like. And so after seven years, uh, Jacob is excited on his wedding night when all the lights are out. Uh, remember, this is before the time of electricity, and he's in his tent. Um, his uncle deceives him. And instead of bringing in Rachel, who he loved and he wanted, he brings, up, he brings in Rachel's older sister, Leah. And uh, Jacob does the business with Leah. Next morning, wakes up, and it's the wrong wife. And he goes to his uncle, and he says, why have you deceived me? Actually, he uses exactly the same phrase that his brother used to Jacob when Jacob had deceived him. And you see, a reality that we discover all the way through the Bible is you reap what you sow. And God uses uh, Jacob reaping the fruits of his deception in another situation to undo Jacob so God can get to the de very depths of him. Actually, what happens is uh, he uh, complains about ending up with Leah and uh, his uncle says, well, well, work for another seven years and you can have Rachel as well. And so he works for another seven years, he gets Rachel as well. And guess what? The two wives then conflict. And uh, then they have kids. They have uh, the 12 kids that become uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's lots of conflict between their kids as well because he's reaping what he's sown. And in all of that conflict and that pressure, Jacob gets undone. Now, in each of these weeks, we have a picture. Uh, Martin and Griselda Faree are helping us with our set design. So big shout out to Martin and Griselda. Amazing, amazing, amazing job. And if you know anything about Griselda, she's incredibly creative and also incredibly prophetic. And so for each of these weeks, she's uh, uh, given us a picture to um, embody the theme of the week. And so the picture for this week is the picture um, on the wall number three. You'll see it just there. But it's a picture of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. And it starts off with a cocoon, and then you can see the wings forming, and then you can see the butterfly coming into being. But you see, for a caterpillar to be transformed into becoming a butterfly, it needs to go through a process. And the process is really interesting because the caterpillar, uh, it firstly feeds, so it gets uh, full of lots of uh, lovely plant and leaves and stuff, and then it forms a hard cocoon and then within the cocoon, it totally dissolves, literally totally dissolves. And so if you were to cut through the picture uh, on the left-hand side, the green cocoon, actually within that is not a caterpillar, but literally caterpillar soup. And having totally dissolved, it then starts to reform, and what's reformed is the butterfly. And if you know the latter stages, the way that the butterfly um, gets strength in its wings is by forcing itself out of the cocoon. And the having to force and push back the pressure and the outer casing is what gives the strength to the wings for the butterfly then to be able to fly, but it goes through a process. Now, what I think is interesting in that is literally for a caterpillar to become a butterfly, it needs to go through a meltdown. Now, I guess, if you're anything like me, you don't like meltdown moments. But actually, meltdown moments, if we put them into Jesus, have the ability to be transformational because God gets to the very depths of who we are. What's been your meltdown moment over the last few months? What's been your meltdown moment over this season? What in this current season has been squeezed to the surface for you? See, our natural response is that we quickly, because we've been unmasked, want to squeeze it back and cover it up again and get it hidden again. What if God's solution isn't that? What if God's solution is actually that we stay in that place of being undone? We own it. And then we invite Jesus into it, and we say, now, Jesus, bring transformation. 
See, in your squeezing, maybe fear got exposed more than ever before. Maybe it was fear around finance. Maybe it was fear around catching COVID-19. Maybe in your squeezing, anger got exposed like never before. Why was the George Floyd killing, which was awful, awful, horrendous on every level, why did it lead to the outpouring of emotion that it did? It wasn't just that it was an awful event, it was that it exposed a history of many, many awful events. It exposed a history where ethnic minorities were more vulnerable to COVID-19 than any other group and no one was paying any significance to it. It brought up to the surface the fact that uh, our black community are disadvantaged economically and socially and politically. And it was that that was squeezed up to the surface from what event? And there's an opportunity in that. That's why I'm passionate about we listen and we learn. And we've begun the process of listening and learning to our black community so that we hear the cry. But more than that, so we move on to be the change. But you see, there's an opportunity because something that is wrong in the face of Jesus, in the sight of Jesus, has been brought up to the surface. Now, that's been true on a wide uh, country level or international level. But things like that will have happened in our own life. What has been squeezed up to the surface for you? There's an opportunity to experience character transformation if you invite Jesus into it. What's lovely with the story of Jacob is there's two moments where he has significant, deep, life-changing encounters with God. One is in Genesis chapter 28. The other is in Genesis chapter 32. Both of them... God takes the initiative and meets Jacob. You read through the text. It's not Jacob suddenly deciding to uh, seek after God. It's God taking the initiative to reach Jacob. What's also interesting about both of those events, they happen 22 years apart. What's also interesting about them is they both happen at points of transition and change. The first happens when Jacob is fleeing from having deceived his brother and he's in fear for his life and he's on his way to his uncle. And then he goes to sleep and he has a dream, commonly uh, known as Jacob's Ladder, the story of Jacob's Ladder. And at the end, he says, this is none other than the house of God and the gateway of heaven. And he has a profound God encounter in the land in between. What the proper word for is liminal space, the place in between too the place of uncertainty. In Genesis chapter 32, after 22 years living with his uncle, he decides now it's time to take his family back home and to face Esau once more. Jacob has no idea what's happening on his journey back. Jacob actually thinks he might end up still walking into Esau's anger and potentially having to fight for his life. And again, he's in the in-between space and it's there God turns up again in the night, in a dark season, in a dark place. God again takes the initiative. This time God wrestles with him, but he has a significant encounter with him. Maybe this season at the moment for you is a dark place. For many of us, it's a season between. The old has been interrupted. We don't know what the new is. So it's our own liminal space. Well, it was in the in-between place that God took the initiative to meet with Jacob and Jacob's character was transformed. What if God wants to use this place of interruption to meet with you and I and bring about a change? In between times are the best places for meeting with God. I love Psalm 34 verse 18 where it says, God is nearer to the brokenhearted. Sometimes I think in the pain of our brokenheartedness, All we see is pain. All we see and feel is the pain. Actually, the reality, because it's what God says, is that God is closer in those moments and wants to do something significant. And in Genesis 32, when God 
meets for the second time with Jacob, there's a really, really significant encounter that is profound in terms of showing us the change that's happened in Jacob. Because I mentioned at the very beginning, what happened at Jacob's birth? He had his hand gripped to something. And what was it? It was Esau's heel. Because he was seeking to supplant Esau. At the end of the encounter that he has with God in Genesis 32, God says, dawn is breaking, I need to go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And you see, in the process of going through meltdown, in the process of going through pressure, in the process of reaping what he'd sown, Jacob's come to a point that he's finally let go of the heel of Esau and he's grabbed hold of God and asked him for his blessing. And it's in those moments that Jacob's identity has changed. And you see, in times of squeezing and pressure, it's really important who we hold on to or what we hold on to. And in many times in those seasons of squeezing and pressure, actually what God wants us to do is let go of the wrong things so we can embrace the right things. In this season, I want to just encourage you, what do you need to take hold of? in this season to enable you to come closer to God. Maybe you need to take hold of watching this every week, tuning in every week. Maybe you need to make some significant relationships, some significant friendships with people who are followers of Jesus. Maybe you need to dust off the Right Now Media subscription and start watching things daily. Do you know, there's a, a series on Right Now Media by a lady called Jenny Allen. I'm a big Jenny Allen fan. She's a great Bible teacher. But it's called Get Out of Your Head. And someone texted me a, a, a while ago that's seen a massive breakthrough over what has been a, a, a life-shaping issue that they've walked into considerable freedom in the last two years over. And they said, just by watching that se- series, it really changed something for them in this process, in this period. Jenny Allen, get out of your head. It's there, it's available, taken from the book of Philippians on Right Now Media. What for you in this season would better help you take hold of God? Because it's interesting, in Genesis 32, Jacob finally lets go of the false identity and he's able to find the true identity. And where all his life he'd sought to supplant Esau... After his encounter with God in Genesis 32, when he refuses to let go of God, and that's who he's got grip of, in the very next story, he bows down seven times at Esau's feet. Five times he calls Esau his Lord, and two times he calls him, he says, I'm your servant. And seven in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, is a sign of completeness. And so Jacob comes to a place where he can completely surrender to Esau, completely surrender to Esau being the head and the lead, because he's found that his true identity comes from being rooted in God. And in that encounter, God changes something in his hip. So from that moment on, Jacob limps. But I think that's a reminder that he's learned now what he needs to do is lean on God and walk with God through the rest of his life. And out of that encounter, God changes his name from Jacob, which means one who supplants, to Israel, which means he wrestles with God. And actually, it's got a sense of wrestling with God and then overcoming. And God speaks to him and says, your name is Jacob. You'll no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. What if in this current season... In all the pressure of it, all the squeezing of it, and maybe the wrestling with God over what is happening, what are you saying, how am I going to find my way through, what if God wants to meet with us in a significant way, that we find who he really has made us to be, and we can let go of the junk, we can let go of the false identities, we can let let go of the masks and the disguises, Let go of the things that we do to hide the blemishes and find that place of surrender and rest and peace 
where God rushes in, embraces us, and helps us become the very people he created us to be. I love the fact that in the book of Revelation, in the promises to those who overcome, it says that we all will have a new name. I believe every one of us has a life that is significant in God. Every one of us has a purpose and a destiny and a calling. And I believe in this season, God is wanting to take us through that cocoon process where maybe we melt down to caterpillar soup so that God can then release our new identity, which is the butterfly that is made to fly and to soar. Let's pray. I felt like that picture of the caterpillar in the cocoon was really significant for this morning. And I felt like there's many people watching with us today. And actually this season has been really pressured. And you've had some meltdown moments. And what you've wanted to do is run away from the meltdown moments. But I believe this morning, God is saying, run to me with your mess. Run to me with your meltdown. Because I'm going to use this meltdown moment to create something beautiful and something that's new. And so, wherever you are, whether you're in bed watching this, whether you're in your garden watching this, whether you're in your living room watching this, whether you're in your kitchen watching this, let's take a moment and let's present ourselves afresh to God. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're here right now with us. Thank you that you know every one of us personally, uniquely. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you're closer to the broken hearted. Thank you, you stepped in every time that Jacob didn't know where to go, didn't know where to run, and didn't know what to do, and didn't know what the future held. Thank you that you ran in. And Lord, I pray that you will run into every home, into every bedroom, into every garden, into every living room right now. Will you run by your spirit and will you bring your presence? Father, I pray that you'll wrap us around with your love. But Lord, we want to put the power of the cross into the very centre, the very core of who we are. Where we were singing earlier that the cross has the final word. Lord, we put the cross into the middle of our meltdown. We put the cross into the middle of our wrestling. We put the cross into the middle of our pain. We put the cross into the middle of our uncertainty. And we pray that you will use these moments to bring deep and long lasting change. And I pray over Restore in this season, you will release many butterflies. And I pray that we will find our wings and our real identity in you. And I pray that you'll teach us how to fly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Haley and Tracy are going to continue to lead us in worship. As they lead us in worship, let's keep reaching out to the Holy Spirit. If God's been speaking to you. If God has been stirring stuff in your life, let's present that to God. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to work as we worship him. And let's keep putting ourselves into the presence of God and into the love of God and asking God to bring deep and lasting change. <laughs>